This is dedicated to the homies that was down since day one. Welcome to Drop D. The following was recorded and produced for Drop D Podcast Productions by Grant Wilson. Welcome to Quick Hits, a JFK assassination news and notes podcast with your hosts, Rob Clark and Doug Campbell. Thank you, Grant, and welcome to the show. This is Quick Hits, a JFK assassination news and notes podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Rob Clark of the Lone Gummin podcast. And this is Doug Campbell, host of the Dallas Action, presented by Wall Street Window, a podcast like Rob's featuring active, ongoing study and analysis into the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Welcome to the show. Okay, let's get started, Rob. Doug, in our last episode when I was in Dallas, yes, sir. you said you said of people that show up to the J- Judith Berry Baker conference and support her story need to think of the credibility as a zero-sum game. If you give her any, then that means that you have less in return. You keep your credibility in your pocket. If you give, and, if you give any to her... You possess less. Zero yes. sum game. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And all hell has broken loose. <laughs> People Since are in I a came tizzy. Back from Dallas, they are. They're worked up. And there's a good reason for it, Doug. Because I know, like you and me and anybody else out there on social media, have seen the pictures. Rob, yes, the pictures of Oliver Stone at the Judith Very Baker conference in Dallas. Uh, I happen to be. Watching that live on the feed, watching Christopher Fulton try to explain the point behind his book, The Inheritance, uh, via Skype, uh, the YouTube feed there of the the Baker Conference. And lo and behold, funny funny part is I'm texting you. You're you're actually sitting at the Kappa Conference, and we're texting, and I got my computer open over here. And he walks in, and he puts a hug on her and calls her a great lady with a great mind. And I texted to you something in effect of, holy shit, you're not going to believe what just happened across town. (laughs) Uh, And just as you said, um, the research community is in quite a tizzy over this apparent endorsement of Judith Baker's story and her book, Me and Lee, by Oliver Stone. A tizzy would be a good way to put it, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been clarified out there, okay, that Oliver Stone is not going to do, or he, let me rephrase that. Judith Very Baker is not going to be in his new documentary at all because Jim DiEugenio is writing it, or it's been written, the interviews have been done, and she's definitely not in it. Um, DiEugenio doesn't buy her story, but Stone, on the other hand, and his son, <laughs> who, Sean Stone, who interviewed Judith Very Baker for his podcast, um, believe her story. And the actual quote was, Judith, I believe you. That That's the quote that is being reported by folks that are supporters of her that were there. Um, you know, I mean, it, how, how do you get Oliver Stone's ear for three hours, dude? I, that is a good question. That's a very good question. I um, I was kind of blown away by what I was seeing. Um, still don't understand it. Um, so, so much. I hope that she's not going to, uh, you know, the sad part about this, Rob, is I think there are a couple of people out there who are being put in a difficult position by this endorsement. Um, a position not of their own making. Um, but yeah, how do you get his ear for three hours? Two different meetings, apparently. Um, Well, you touched on something important there, and I I believe you're speaking of some of the people that were uh, speaking at her conference. Yes. Now, here's my take on it, okay? If you choose – and you can say it's not Judith Very Baker's conference, but I can tell you this. She owns the LLC solely for that conference. Now, author – JFK Conference, LLC. You're making a good point here, and I think this point needs to be made. You and I have talked about this privately, that 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 there is – it's called JFK Conferences LLC. It's a limited liability corporation. Now, yes. the author of um, – uh, so what's the name of that book? Survivor's Guilt, about the Secret Service, Vince Palomara, 
Um, he made a point because he has spoken at, at, at that conference with that group. He's a trying day author. Of and, course he is. And he made the point in the education forum in this thread that's sort of blown up about this whole thing that it's it's not the JVB conference. It's the trying day. It's a trying day conference. Well, you hmm. know, that turns out not to be the case when you look at who the incorporating officers are of this JFK conferences LLC thing. It's it's um, she's in she's she's in charge of it, you know. Yeah. And um, if it was a trying day conference. They would have spelled the word conference right on the cover of their JFK conference outline that they handed everybody when they came in the door. Yeah, yeah. I um, I would assume th- a publishing company has a good editor, uh, but that's just me. You know, coming from a point of a, of, of a grammar Nazi, which I am, uh, I don't always speak in perfect grammar, but I take a, a tremendous amount of pride in even the way I compose emails. I edit them numerous times and i write a lot of copy also lots of copy and i cannot eat for the life of me imagine someone looking down at that misprint and knowing they have a stack of a thousand of these things and being okay with passing them out yeah i mean it's big (laughs) bold letters right on the front jfk conference yeah they and and that's a big bold statement as to the you know things like thoroughness Things like pride, <laughs> you know, that is a big red flag. I guess, I guess what I'm saying. If you're okay with putting out, you know, something that I wouldn't pass them out. I would just if that, you know, if I got those like in the in the at the last moment at the conference, I would just tell people, yeah, we don't have any programs. Sorry, they, they we they didn't make it before I would pass that nonsense out. But yeah, and um, then, look, in this day and age of self-publishing and and being able to do everything online or through Amazon, or I'm sure there's a hundred different publishing companies out there. He made the choice to go with trying day who also publishes Judith Baker's books and a bunch of other nonsensical bull crap books. And that's his choice. And he also has a choice to say no when they invite him to the conference to speak, you know, because he's lending credence to what, they're doing over there here's what i want people number one uh, where am i at on this thing okay before we continue to take oliver stone so seriously i would caution people to remember that by telling her that i believe you um he's he's admitting that he accepts as fact that the Secret Service sought out Lee Oswald so Lee Oswald could help them prevent an assassination by going around Dallas and pointing to places where an assassin might hide. Oliver Stone is telling us he accepts this as reality. He's telling us he accepts as reality that Lee Oswald spent you know, 12 hours in New Orleans in 100-degree heat cutting cancerous tumors out of 600 mice. Yeah. Okay, this is what Oliver Stone accepts as reality now if if we accept what he said to her. Okay, I am now... The point I'm... I'm this has reminded me in a big way that no matter what his film did to kick loose all those files from the public outcry back in the 90s, no matter how important this film was to this movement, ultimately, I guess he's just a Hollywood director. And based on his hmm, his need to, to portray Vladimir Putin and all the propaganda on RT as fact as well, and do these nine-hour interviews with Putin that make him look like a, a, a benevolent soul and and toe this line like John Barber toes, well, you know, Trump and JFK, they're fighting the both deep state, this effing nonsense. Um, I'm, I, think, I think maybe Mr. Stone is a little more gullible than we wish to admit. And I'll hush now, Rob. <laughs> no, that's a good point. And, you know, when he spoke at the banquet, there was a whole lot of woe is me. I mean, there was a lot of cheerleading, like, you know, hey, you know, you guys are the researchers. You guys are the ones finding the truth and keep up the good fight and yada, 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 right? Yes, sir. But but there was also a woe is me factor to what he was saying. Like, 
that he, you know, he went out on a limb to make this movie JFK and he was essentially, his career was ruined because he made the movie. I sacrificed all for you people. Right. You know, so, oh, let's bow down. Thank you so much, sir. You know, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, well, that was a choice he made. Okay. Yes. You know, very much so. And, you know, the movie made a lot of money and it won some awards. So, you know, his choice of movies that he's made after that, I think, I don't know if he can just blame JFK for what he's done since. I blame his choice of movies. <laughs> I mean, it, blame, it, blame, blame the choice of projects if you look at the lineup, for the I arc. Mean, yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. only decent one was after that was Natural Born Killers. And after that, I couldn't tell you the last Oliver Stone movie to come out. To be honest with you. Uh, didn't he make uh, one of the Ice Age movies? <laughs> oh, anyway, well, Rob, we'll uh, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, we'll put that topic to the side, and we'll continue to take the pulse of what goes on around this uh, this this dizzying bit of news. And uh, uh, and then, like we say, guys, um, you know, take take Oliver Stone's. Um, I don't know, for lack of a better term, relevance with a grain of salt now, knowing that he endorses the idea that Lee Oswald smuggled uranium back to Louisiana in a diaper bag. So there you go. <laughs> Moving on now. Rob, I wanted to share uh, a new blog post by John Simkin with you. Just get your uh, thought because it's uh, got a few things in here. Uh, get your thoughts on. I wanted to share this with you. What do you think, man? May I? Please do, sir. Please do. It is a new blog post um, for you and the listeners. Some choice excerpts uh, from Spartacus Internet, or excuse me, Spartacus Educational by research scholar John Simkin. You're familiar with Mr. Simkin, right, Rob? Yep, man. Right. Yes, sir, I am. Well, this is titled uh, something he wrote called "Robert Kennedy Was America's First Assassination Conspiracy Theorist." Um, hmm. Yeah, Mr. Simkin writes that uh, David Talbot wrote in his excellent book, Brothers, The Hidden History of the Kennedy Years, that Robert F. Kennedy was America's first assassination conspiracy theorist. Soon after the arrest of Lee Oswald, Kennedy received a phone call from J. Edgar Hoover, who insisted that Cuba's communist government was behind the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Hoover claimed that Oswald had shuttled in and out of Cuba which was untrue. In reality, Oswald or someone impersonating him had tried only once without success to enter Cuba through Mexico in September of 1963. Um, do you, I, I would be interested to read the site, that, to read the document or, or the eyewitness testimony uh, of that phone call putting Oswald. Uh, have you read? I, I, it must be slipping my mind. You would think I would be aware of that, but I'm not. Yeah, I don't know either, man. Yeah. Um, what do you think about Mexico City? He mentions that here. Uh, tried only once without success to enter Cuba through Mexico City in September of 63. I don't know if I've ever asked you this question. Do you believe that was Oswald in Mexico City or an imposter? I believe it was an imposter. I believe what J. Edgar Hoover said, uh, that the CIA was trying to pull one over on folks i don't know why and but i don't I, I i just can't believe that somebody as miserly as oswald i mean because you got to remember man it's a long trip even from texas it's a long trip to mexico city dude i mean you're talking over a thousand miles by bus each way it's not cheap he's got to pay for a bus ticket a hotel he's got to eat you know and and all this so, I mean, no, Oswald didn't like spending money. So I, I just don't see it. I, I, I don't, I don't think it was. Um, I think if it were him, if it were the real Oswald, then we would have real photos that that, that the CIA and the Warren Commission, they would be falling over themselves, tripping over themselves to get those real photos out there. You my know, passion. yeah, of course. And like you know, Hoover never believed it, and. uh you know, nothing's ever surfaced of any proof whatsoever that Lee Harvey Oswald went to Mexico City other than some shady 
uh, eyewitness accounts, you know. That's exactly right. Have you ever heard of William Walton, Rob? I have not. Posthumously. Um, says here, however, uh, Kennedy did send William Walton, an old political friend of the Kennedy family, to the Soviet Union to make inquiries and to speak to Georgi Bolshakov, a Soviet agent formerly stationed in Washington. Says Bolshakov had played a major role in diplomacy between the U.S. and Soviet Union. RFK had secretly met with him on numerous occasions. He denied that the Soviets were involved in the assassination. Walton told Bolshakov, that the Kennedy family believed that President Kennedy had been killed by a large political conspiracy. Perhaps there was only one assassin, but he did not act alone. Walton added that the Kennedys made it clear that they did not believe the conspirators were acting on foreign orders. This information was actually included in a memo prepared by Bolshakov for the KGB. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Um... This is interesting. Let me get your take on this. Uh, RFK phoned Julius Drasnan in Chicago, an expert on union corruption, and asked him to look into whether there was any mafia involvement in the killing. He was especially interested in Sam Giancana, which I imagine uh, for many, many reasons, who had been overheard on FBI wiretaps making threats against JFK. Um... Seymour Hirsch interviewed Drasnan in 94, and he admitted that he recruited a few friends who were also in law enforcement. And over the next few weeks, this ad hoc group looked into the ties between Oswald and the Chicago mob, but the group could find no evidence that Giancana's henchmen had anything to do with Kennedy's assassination. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I've never, never even sniffed a connection any kind of direct connection between uh, Oswald and the Chicago mob, but an indirect connection, like a couple of degrees of separation through the gunboat Cowboys to Giancana is absolutely possible. You know, <laughs> Lorne Hall and, and those guys and Santiago and Hargraves and, and, and that whole bunch. I mean, they were, they got, they got a lot of money from Giancana. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, they associated with Marcelo in New Orleans. And we know the kind of folks that were hanging in New Orleans and, you know, meeting with General Walker and General Walker meeting with people yeah. in New Orleans and <clears throat> so on and so forth. So there you go. And it's entirely possible that um, Dutch Muret, um, that, that that he, in his capacity as a, I guess, a bookmaker for Marcello and that bunch, uh, that's, this is Oswald's uncle um, um, for the listeners, uh, that he may have met some of Giancana's people, but, uh, you know. Because Marcelo and uh, Giancana were certainly tight. Now, here we go. Here we go. This is um, this next part. Uh, it's this this thing to sort of throw shade at Bobby Kennedy by some in the research community that you and I have, have spoken about in the past. And certainly Ted Rubenstein and myself have discussed a bunch on the Dallas action. Listen to this. Again, this is from David Talbot, Rob. When Bobby Kennedy told his comrade in arms, Harry Ruiz Williams, one of your guys did it, he might uh, might as well have been saying one of our guys did it or even one of my guys did it. He's talking about RFK <laughs> here. Bobby was saying that his brother had been killed by someone in his own anti-Castro operation. Now, that's entirely possible. Uh, He was supposed to know where the darkness fell and how to keep his brother safe from it. His brother's death was his fault. This is certainly another wound that his brother's killers aimed to inflict, for they knew it would not be enough to assassinate the president. They would have to find a way to stop his avenging brother from coming after them as well, to hobble him with guilt and doubt. This sentence, Rob, his brother's death was his fault is even more ridiculous than his Bill Harvey flew from Rome to Dallas thing, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, it's uh, it's a reach for sure, but, you know, uh, I don't even know where to start, dude. <laughs> we, could, <clears throat> we could probably spend an entire episode of one of three shows uh, picking that apart, could we not? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't want Grant to start whipping you over there. So, <laughs> <laughs> we're that guys. Uh, the producer is uh, he's he's helping us stay focused. 
um, nowadays. Yes, yes. This we've, is quick hits. We need to move it along. Yes, we've given him. Yes. We've given Grant yet another task to do. So, uh, and we thank you, Mister Grant. So, yes, I'm get, I'm getting the anyway. That I wanted to share that with you, Rob. Get you. Do you have any other thoughts as far as this? Um, this this effort to cast a little bit of blame on Dealey Plaza on RFK, I think it's pretty ridiculous. <laughs> Myself. I mean, if you if you if you believe that the mafia had something to do with it, and we know Kennedy was chasing them down, dragging them in, excuse me, in front of Congress, and and you know trying them on racketeering charges and going after them pretty good. We know they kicked Marcellos out of the country twice. Um, so they were definitely angry him, and of course Hoffa was no fan of him either. So if you believe that side of the conspiracy, then it's almost feasible that one could look at it that way, though, Doug. I guess so. I guess you're right, Rob. Um, an open mind, I guess, uh, we'll keep there. What do you think? Yes, an open mind and an open heart. And an open heart. Yes, sir. absolutely. Yes. Um, so moving right along, sir, it is time. Is it time for Rob Clark's JFK Research Community Facebook shenanigans segment? <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, now Let's I know get- that. I know that laugh. That's that's uh, that's Rob Clark's uh, boy. Uh, Wait till you see what I've got for you laugh. So, yes. play tail, sir. All right, I, ha- I have a sound bite, a short one minute sound bite that I'm going to play, mm-hmm. and uh, and then uh, we'll get into the comments o- on this video. Okay. All are right. You, are you ready? I am ready, sir. All right. This is Doctor Cyril Wecht. Uh. I figured it'd be nice and topical since he was at the conference as well, and he's the chairman of the board of Kappa. Yeah. And here we go. We have a one-minute comment from Dr. Cyril Weck, then we shall discuss. My passion has nothing to do with <clears throat> posthumously exculpating Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, I don't find him a very he, uh, lovable kind of a person, uh, you know, forgetting all about yeah. So I don't give a damn about Oswald. And I say to audiences, anybody, you want Oswald as a shooter? Take him. Here, here's my gift. That's all I want and need is a second shooter. Because now, you see, we've got the conspiracy. Under the laws of Texas and the federal government, two or more people involved, right? Then you've got a conspiracy. And I explained to people, because a lot of people say, in fact, a couple of people even said to me last night before I spoke, you know, well, what's the problem? Maybe there was your... I said, ah, that's their problem, you see. Uh, they can't have a second person because the moment you have a second person, you've got a conspiracy. The moment you have a conspiracy, then you've got to delve. And once you open door one, then who knows how many more doors are going to be open. And I always use the line, you are pregnant or you are not pregnant. It can't be in between, okay? <laughs> so. Huh. <laughs> <clears throat> Was that Boomhauer from King of the Hill? I mean, what was going on there? <laughs> that's just that's just Dr. Cyril Weck. That's how he talks. He uh, is an impassioned speaker. Yes, he is. He is. He gets a little passionate sometimes. And there was a little dissension about his comments because, you know, I, he doesn't give a damn about Oswald. You want Oswald as a shooter? Take him. He's my gift to you. I, I don't care about Oswald. He was a piece of crap. Um, but there had, there had to be a second shooter. That's what I'm saying. You know, that's what he's saying. One big problem I had with one thing that Big Jim Garrison said. Um, I believe it was in the. I believe it was in um, the Men Who Killed Kennedy. Uh, he made the comment where you know people have vilified Lee Oswald when in re- and I remember the quote. I you've probably seen it too. Um, and and when I when I when I repeat it, you'll go, oh yeah. He says, but with, when in reality. The boy was probably a hero. You remember seeing that? I do. Yeah, I, I disagree. Um, I think he was one hundred percent entangled with this um, with this anti Castro militant stuff that went went on. I think he was willing to, as long as he thought he was doing his mission. I think he was willing to do dirty work. And I'll say it before, and I'll say it again: not guilty. Yes. I'll go that far. Lee Oswald was not guilty. Innocent? No, I'm not going that far. Because the minute somebody said, oh, shit, the president's been shot outside, he, um, he immediately knew who did it. I am convinced. And uh, now yeah. I will not go this um, 
Um, yeah, what's that uh, YouTube channel, Saint Lee Oswald? You know, like Saint Lee, yeah. like he's a saint. I know. Yeah. No, thank you. No, thank you. I don't believe that for a minute. And I believe there's probably, you know, the stories of him roughing Marie, um, um, uh, Marina up. I said, you know what? In a straight up reality kind of way, looking at it in a real world way, there's probably some truth to that. Yeah. I mean, I was reading something today, you know, about how. Uh, well, it was actually Demoran Shields' uh, "I Am a Patsy" manuscript about how you know he was talking to Lee about him. You know, he was telling Lee, you know, you shouldn't hit a woman. You can't do that stuff over here. You know, maybe in Russia oh. or something. But uh, <clears throat> he kept he kept telling George that she's a tiger. Look at all these scratches all over my arm. He's like, she just pushes me to do it. You know, yeah. so they. I mean, they might have been arguing. Couples argue. Couples fight. Couples, you know, especially back then, it was a little bit more acceptable to, you know, bitch slap your old lady. Um, well, you know, that 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 DeMoran Shield manuscript, <laughs> I'm a patsy, I'm a patsy, <laughs> man, that is an amazing read. That's a and for for any listeners, uh, you know, for a little bit of context, George DeMoran Shield was a Russian immigrant. He was a white Russian. He was a hard rightist. Um, who pretty rich, you know, kind of a globe trotting, uh, a barren type guy, and he bef- befriended poverty stricken Lee Oswald, the communist, uh, when he came back from uh, the Soviet Union. But you know, this guy, what's amazing about that thing, Rob, is how he paints Marina Oswald in that man- manuscript blows my mind. You know, um, I don't know how how far into it you are, but George de Morenshield was a racist. He was a straight racist, and all you have to do is read that thing. And he did not like African Americans, and he had plenty no. of pejorative terms for him. Yes, and he paints Marina Oswald as having a sexual fascination with African American men. And uses it all through this thing to really sort of degrade her and, 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 and talk bad about her and make her out to be like some, you know. Um, she's a fan of the BBC. Do what? I said she's a fan of the BBC. I guess. I don't know. But that's, um, that's oh, Rob, come on. <laughs> I was thinking, I was thinking, what, did, what does British television have to do with anything? <laughs> I'm trying to make the connection between this and like Top Gear. I didn't know. I didn't know what was going on. But <laughs> but okay. Now uh, uh he said uh you can have Lee Oswald. So there was a little uproar in the community about that. Yeah, so let's get through some of these comments here. Okay. And again, for the sake of the innocent, they shall remain nameless. Um one person said, even though I respect Cyril for being a forensic pathologist, he has kind of lost his credibility over the years. Because he always claims that the single bullet theory is the biggest smoking gun of this case. I kind of disagree on that. I think the biggest smoking guns are the witnesses and the medical evidence. There are I, there are a few of those. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Is there yeah. a biggest one? Um, I would say if, if I had to pick one, I, it would have to be that quote in the HSCA from the FBI – um, ballistics expert that you found in his testimony saying, uh, no, that's, I can't even tie the, I can't tie the magic bullet to the rifle. Right. That's the biggest smoking gun. Because if you start there and go, okay, the FBI guy went up to Capitol Hill, put his hand on a Bible and told Congress, all I can tell you is this perfect bullet was fired out of a similar, similar barrel that I can't tie this perfect bullet to this rifle to the exclusion of all other rifles yeah that's about as smoking gun as it gets yeah and you found that so i got to give you credit for that absolutely thank you thank you yeah um and somebody also comments well if you could have had two shooters in daily plaza who did not know each other so technically that's not a conspiracy (laughs) two shooters in daily plaza that did not know each other that is absolutely possible if they're Two different hit teams arranged by the same conspiracy. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Somebody commented, okay, and we still can't find that second gunman after all these years. I believe LJ Delsa found him. Yeah. Yeah. He told us too, didn't he? Right. We got to get that clip and play it for the listeners on here. Uh, I know. We got to find it. We will. I can find it. I can find it. But yeah, uh, Lawrence Howard. Um, but uh, you know what? 
there are any num there, there are a number of credible experts for snipers, for shooters that day. I think um, Howard, um, uh, who else? Even Sturgis, you know. Um, yeah. The Diaz Lands brothers, um, several others, several others. And then we have uh, the the problem with Wecht is he is not using science as his criteria, yet he is a scientist. This is why his opinions are questionable. And somebody says, well, he's made a lot of money being a critic, not only for the JFK case, but many, many others, and be inconsequential otherwise. He lost his credibility years ago. I was under the impression that Cyril Wecht does not collect a fee for conference appearances. He's just trying to do his part. Um, well, I don't know about that. Yeah. Um, I could be wrong, or I could. You know what? Uh, it wouldn't be the first time somebody in the community is giving me bad information, Rob. So, <laughs> yeah, I've heard uh, something <laughs> totally different. We'll talk about off the air. Yes, sir. Ten four. Okay. Yeah. Um, somebody just says, "Well, I love just listening to him speak. Whatever he says, I love it." <laughs> you know what? The night we saw him speak, you and I in 2014 sat at sat at a table, of uh, what probably five feet from the podium when he spoke, and uh, it is an enjoyable presentation, or at least the one five years ago was for me. Yes, yes. Uh, get you pumped up. You, it, he really is enjoyable, and he's a super nice guy. Yeah, and then the last comment on this thread: How did so many idiots get to post in one effing place? <laughs> Welcome to Facebook. Welcome to Facebook, shenanigans. Welcome Thank to you. Facebook. Thank you for joining us on Facebook shenanigans. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for presenting Facebook shenanigans, Mr. Clark. Well, you're very, very welcome, Doug. All right. Now, you have also, uh, I, I, I take it, listener emails for us to peruse? I do. All right. I love these. Uh, let me uh, pull it up here. Hold on. Hold, please. I should have had this ready to go, and, uh, I'm a shithead. Okay. I know. Sorry. Come on, man. Sorry, Grant. Sorry, Grant. Sorry, Doug. Oh, man. Oh, you're fine, buddy. You're fine. Um, Dr. Cyril Wick. You know, even, even my mother is, uh, is aware of who Dr. Cyril Wick is. Um. Okay. I got it. Thank you for pandering for me for a minute. Okay, here we go. Hello, Robin Doug. Well, hello there. <laughs> I've listened to your latest podcast, and as always, they were great. Once again, every stone someone turns find underneath the Edgar's Bureau. Now, let me preface this by saying this fellow who is emailing us is from Greece, so his English is a little okay. iffy. So let me. I guess uh, what our 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 our, our wonderful listener is saying is, uh, every time you, you turn over a rock, you find the FBI. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that, dear listener. Yeah. That seems a little bit awkward because researchers are always trying to mention the company as a major part of the conspiracy. I believe he's referring to the CIA. For many years, I believed LHO did it, mainly because of people around me who, without any knowledge of the case, were and still are, as a majority, they killed him. Also, I was a lone gunman believer because I debunked, by a kind of my logic, most of conspiracy theorists' points as irrational steps or biased. But two things changed my mind. Vincent Bugliosi's interviews... And LG believers, I guess that's lone gunmen believers yeah. themselves. For example, uh, Bugliosi asked quite cunningly as a very experienced prosecutor, who was this super mafia sniper who missed the first shot while limo is closer to him? You can answer. And who is this lone loser who achieved two world-class shots of the century in five inches? <laughs> I guess that's five seconds, and fled the area unnoticed. Amen yeah, to I, that. Yeah, you know, you, yeah, buddy. Our listener is exactly right. <laughs> he says, you get what I mean. Yes, 100%. Yes. Second example, all those lone gunman theorists, even a couple of your sh your show guests, you asked them, for example, 
And what about, according to the Warren Commission, the 17 out of 22 police officers in the area who heard a fourth shot? And your guest answered, oh, you know, sometimes people overheard things or the acoustics in their mind, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever someone asks, they answer with generic generalizations. Thank you. Know, you. <laughs> oh, go ahead. The listener, I was I was just going to say, he's he's um, 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 your sort of technique or, or your thing that you always say, uh, first day testimony, first day testimony, first day witness testimony. Yes. Um, yeah, that's what he's saying. You know, however many was a 17 out of 22 cops said four shots. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. That, you know, that's an immediate immediate what did you hear what did you see you know and that's just cops that's not actual people in Dilly plaza that's cops that were there around there that's just cops that's right so and uh he says uh thank you robin doug for your time and to let me share some thoughts even if i'm far away from the states i have a question if you like what do you think about the torbit document i think uh some people believe this is a company's document besides that what's your opinion Thanks in advance. I hope you guys are fine and strong. Uh, hey, thanks for the email, dude, over there in Greece. Yes. And, yes. and thank you for listening over there in Greece. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Mr. Panos. Dude. So, Doug, the Torbit document. Boy, he raises an interesting point. What a question. The Torbit document. Wow. Well, it's um, somebody learned a lot of stuff and wove a fanciful tale. Um, <laughs> it is um, full of a lot of crazy stuff. That's a good way to put it. Um, Here's what I equated to, Doug. Yeah. So a person like you or I who knows a ton of, of stuff about this case. Me or you could create such a document containing within our theory of what happened in the JFK assassination and anonymously put it out into the community and just see what happens. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just saying, you know, that this this guy, uh, we know who wrote it. it was, he was a lawyer. I forget his name. It's, it was on the tip of my tongue. Well, we think we know. Right. We yeah. think we know. Because um, um, it was uh, it, there were, even, I heard something, even the name he was practicing law under might not have been his real name. And definitely Torbit was a pseudonym. And, right. Um, yeah, it's real murky. It's very murky, at least for me. Yeah, it could it could easily be a company document. I mean, it could be um, a company document or a piece of disinformation put out. Um, uh, I mean, there is accurate information contained in the Torbit document. Right. There are there are names and places and people uh, associated with the assassination that he does throw in there that do have ties to it. Yes. Yes. But as far uh, as this CMC thing in right. Italy and. And um, there was an there was an entire chapter on the guy up in Canada. What was his name? Um, you know uh, who I'm talking. Um, I can't think of the name now. Uh, I would have to go. I, it's uh, that's on the tip of my tongue too. The, the 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 cat that was up in Canada controlling it and moving money and this and that. But there's yeah, so know. much in there about you know all these elitists who own estates at uh, this trial compound in Jamaica planned it there and Connolly was you know part of that there's oh, there's too wow. many moving parts there's too yeah. many moving parts but there are some things in there that intrigue me because when i read through it it it, it go oh that's got the ring of truth like the story of the american council of christian churches and the one church close to the tippet shooting and, you know, right. um, William Seymour hid in the basement and then another somebody else came and got him, what, 12 hours later. Um, <laughs> th certain things that, that hit, that kind of, they ring a bell. They make a certain nerve stand up, you know, um, little things in you, there like that. But Yeah, I mean, you could see where somebody who has researched the case has come up with their own conclusions and has written it down. 
as though it were gospel fact. And that's what I think that document is personally. Yeah, I, either either that or um, um, Penn Jones wrote it. No, <laughs> you know, you know what uh, I told Ted Rubenstein one time, just kind of joking with him I, and, oh. uh, about the Torbett document. And then I'll then I'll I'll, I'll let it rest. Um, you know, uh, May Brussel had something to do with that thing getting publicized, getting out into the public. And I always remember May complaining sometimes that she wasn't taken seriously as a researcher because she was a woman. You know, right? Yeah. And and one day I'm driving down the road just thinking about all this stuff, and it hit me. One, what if I can see like this alternate reality where May Brussel puts the name William Torbett on it, and and puts her research out because I tell you what you do, and and our listener um um, um in Greece uh, who sent the um sent the email, and you guys do this as an exercise. The Torbett document, the way it reads. Is very sort of scatterbrained, you know, and I'm not saying May Brussel was scatterbrained, but she was very stream of consciousness. And uh, tonight, later, Rob, just get out the Tor- Torbett document and read it in May Brussel's voice, and you'll go, oh, "Holy crap!" <laughs> That's a very good point. Uh, you know, I just and try that. Possible. Try that experiment. Read the Torbett document and let let May Brussel's voice be the narrative voice in your head. Um, the only thing missing was the Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. And uh, 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 well, maybe she hadn't got around to to discovering Dornberger at that point. I don't know. But um, but thank you for the for the for the email. That was pretty awesome. Uh, it's a great yes. question. Great. Thank email. you, Mister Panos. Thank you. That's right. And do you want to tell every give everybody the email address once again, Rob? Yes. If you would like to have your question or comment read on the air by us, uh, please send to. Quick hits JFK at gmail a dot a com. There you go. What do you think, Rob? Uh, that that was pretty quick. You want to go ahead and wrap this up while uh, we can while it still qualifies as quick. Yes, let's put a condom on it and wrap it up. <laughs> there we go, guys. Don't forget. Oh, wrong show. Wrong show. That's the next one we're going to record. <laughs> <laughs> guys, don't forget to check out Rob's The Lone Gunman podcast. Um, and don't forget to check out me on the Dallas Action, presented by Wall Street Window. Both shows, anywhere and everywhere that you find podcasts. We are on places like Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, the Tangent Bound Network. We're all over the place. Tune in, listen, and learn. Also, big, huge thanks to producer Grant. Thanks to you guys for hanging out and playing along. So, for Rob Clark, for Producer Grant, I am Doug Campbell saying until next time, guys, we are out.